please just send me food so I have a chance at living? Welcome to McBurdo's expedition into the unknown and terrible. We have been stuck here in the ice for an eternity. Come into the captain's cabin and warm yourself before you head back out onto the deck. Welcome to my cabin. How long have we been trapped in this infernal ice pack? Or in the summer, tropical estuary. Today I shall read to you from my selection of innumerable primary sources because the past said it better. Writers can embellish on a story that they've heard, but hearing the words of someone who actually witnessed an event sometimes shocking always amazing i have not read this before so we're going to experience it together i'm going to break in with my opinions chances are as you are a crew member of the hms miser you are not easily upset by the dark and terrible none of these are very happy the odd one is it's a surprise I will warn you now that these may not have the most politically acceptable ideas or language because they come from the past and things were different then. So make yourself comfy, grab yourself a suitable beverage, and let us block out this howling wind together. Hello again. Welcome to my cabin for more depressing story time with Captain McBurdo. And the past said it better. And uh, today, this is one that uh, some of our American viewers might have encountered. Uh, this is the Richard Freethorne letter, the letter he wrote to his parents. He came to America in 1623 as an indentured servant. He had to spend uh, 10 years as a an indentured worker on a tobacco farm. Some people who hired indentured servants treated them well and most treated them terribly. It wasn't slavery because it did end if you survived, but like with slavery, there was no inducement to treat your indentured servants better or there was no reward if they lived or died. So once you had them, you could do what you wanted to them. And if they lived at the end of their 10 years, they were free or seven years, or 15 years, and, uh... Right. This is the story of Richard Frethorn. So Frethorn appears to have been indentured because his family were poor. They were receiving poor relief in St. Dunstan in the east, in London, and uh, they were on poor relief from the parish, and someone went, well, you're able-bodied to the colonies with you. It is suggested that when he was taken from his family and I don't want to say made a slave, but it was essentially slavery. He was rounded up and sent off at the age of 12 to a whole new world. And if he lived or died, it, it didn't matter. He was poor and the poor were superfluous. There was no need for them. They were not wanted. So let us have his letters to his parents. There was like a, an idea with transportation that transportation was nice and, you know, it, we were giving him new opportunities and he could go to this wonderful place where the land flowed with milk and honey and Amir, Amir, seven, ten years, he'll be a man and he'll have had food and he'll have skills and he'll know how to live. So really, it's like kind of being an apprentice. It's not so bad, really. How about new? Loving and kind, father and mother, my most humble duty remembered to you, hoping in God for your good health, as I myself am at the making thereof. This is to let you understand that I, your child, am in a most heavy case by reason of the country, which is such that it causeth much sickness, such as the scurvy and the bloody flux, and diverse other diseases, 
which maketh the body very poor and weak. This is not starting out good. And I actually know how this one ends. <laughs> I do because I've encountered this story before, this letter uh, in, in school. And when we are sick, there is nothing to comfort us. For since I came out of the ship, I never ate anything but peas and loblolly. That is, uh, watery gruel, porridge, but it's really watery. It's what they'd feed the sick in the Navy, which is why the surgeon's assistants were called loblolly boys, because they would bring the sick or the injured loblolly. As for deer or venison, I never saw any since I came into this land. There is, indeed, some fowl, but we are not allowed to go and get it, but must work hard both early and late for a mess of water gruel and a mouthful of bread and beef. A mouthful of bread for a penny loaf must serve four men, which is most pitiful. That is not a lot. You're probably thinking like a round loaf of bread, like, you know, what we would consider really excellent artisanal bread and cut between four people for a day and four men working like farm work. You would be grieved if you did know as much as I when people cry out day and night, oh, they are in England without their limbs and would not care to lose a limb to be in England again, yea, though they beg from door to door. For we live in fear of the enemy every hour, yet we have had combat with them, and we took two alive and made slaves of them. So by the enemy, they're talking about the indigenous people here. But it was by policy, for we are in great danger, for our plantation is very weak by reason of the death and sickness of our company. For we came but twenty for the merchants, and they are half dead just. And we look every hour when two more should go. Of the twenty who came, ten have died, and two more are sick. And yet there came some four other men to live with us, of which there is but one alive, and our lieutenant is dead, and also his father and his brother. And there are some five or six of last year's twenty, of which there are but three left, so that we are fain to get other men to plant with us, and yet we are but thirty-two to fight against three thousand if they should come. This is written by someone who's 12, 13, maybe 14, but they think 12. Maybe now he's here in the new world after the sailing, so maybe, yeah, 13 or 14. And the nighest help that we have is 10 miles of us. And when the rogues overcame this place, the last time they slew 80 persons. How then shall we do? For we lie even in their teeth. They may easily take us. But for the fact that God is merciful and can save with a few as well as with many, as he showed to Gilead. And like Gilead's soldiers, if they were lapped water, we drink water, which is but weak. And I have nothing to comfort me, nor is there nothing to be gotten here but sickness and death, except in the event that one had money to lay out in some things for profit. But I have nothing at all. No, not a shirt to my back, but two rags, nor clothes, but one poor suit, nor but one pair of shoes, but one pair of stockings, but one cap and two bands. Those would be his collar. <laughs> Having said that, I do have some thoughts. So he's out there. He's got no clothing, nothing to protect him against the cold. And he's just this thin, poor, starving little boy. And normally I am not, Captain. But think of the children. But I just, it's just, it's just awful. My cloak is stolen by one of my fellows and to his dying hour would not tell me what he did with it. But some of my fellows saw him have butter and beef out of a ship, which my cloak, I doubt not, paid for. So I have not a penny, nor a penny worth, to help me to either spice or sugar or strong waters, without which one cannot live here. For as stronger beer in England doth fatten and strengthen, so water here doth wash and weaken these here, and only keeps their life and soul together. 
but I am not half of a quarter so strong as I was in England, and all is for want of victuals. I am a little hungry. For I do protest unto you that I have eaten more in one day at home than I have allowed me here for a week. I mean, think about that. We're talking about a kid who has not had, uh, who was, his family were on poor relief. So it's not like they were living high on the hug by any stretch. And he's saying he ate more in one day home in England than he is here in Virginia. And when you think about it, that's with everyone dying. <laughs> so how much food was there for these people? And I assume that the lieutenant was the head of the plantation or perhaps the head of this group of indentured servants the non-indentured leader of the servants. You have given more than my day's allowance to a beggar at the door, and if Mr. Jackson had not relieved me, I should be in a poor case. But he is like a father, and she like a loving mother doth still help me. For when we go to Jamestown, that is 10 miles of us, there lie all the ships that come to land, and there they must deliver their goods. And when we went up to town, we would go, as it may be, on Monday at noon, and come there by night, and then load the next day by noon, and go home in the afternoon, and unload, and then away again in the night, and be put up about midnight. Then, if it rained or blowed never so hard, we must lie in the boat on the water, and have nothing but a little bread. For when we go into the boat, we have a loaf allowed to two men, so they get twice as much food. Yay! And it is all if we stayed there two days, which is hard, and we must lie all that while in the boat. But that good man Jackson pitied me and made me a cabin to lie always when I come up. And he would give me some poor jacks, which are a kind of fish, to take home with me, which comforted me more than peas or water gruel. Oh, they be very godly folks and love me very well and will do anything for me. And he much marveled that you would send me to servant to the company. He saith I had been better knocked on the head. What did you do? And indeed so I find it now to my great grief and misery. And I saith that if you ever love me, you will redeem me suddenly, for which I do entreat and beg. I need help! If you cannot get the merchants to redeem me for some little money, then for God's sake get a gathering or entreat some good folks to lay out a little sum of money in meal and cheese and butter and beef. Any eating meat will yield great profit. Oil and vinegar is very good, but father, the great loss is leaking. But for God's sake, send beef and cheese and butter or more of one sort and none of the other. Just like, please just send me food, please. Please parents, if you can't get me out of this. Throw me a frickin' bone here. Please just send me food so I have a chance at living. But if you send cheese, it must be very old cheese. And at the fishmongers, you may buy very food cheese for tuppence farthing or halfpenny, and that will be liked very well. But if you send cheese, you must have a care how you pack it in barrels, and you must put cooper's chips between every cheese, or else the heat of the hold will rot them. And look whatsoever you send me. Be in never so much. Look, whatever I make of it, I will deal truly with you. I will send it over and beg profit to redeem me. And if I die before it comes, I have entreated Goodman Jackson to send you the worth of it, who hath promised he will. Let me help you, please. If you send, you must direct your letters to Goodman Jackson at Jamestown, a gunsmith. You must set down his freight because there may be more of his name there. Good father, do not forget me, but have mercy and pity my miserable case. I know if you did but see me, you would weep to see me, for I have but one suit. But though it is a strange one, it is very well guarded. Wherefore, for God's sake, pity me. I pray you to remember my love to all my friends and kindred. I hope all my brothers and sisters are in good health, and that as for my part, I have set down my resolution that certainly will be, that is, the answer of this letter will be life or death to me. Therefore, good father, 
send as soon as you can. And if you send anything, let this be the mark. R.O.T. Richard Frethern, Martin's Hundred. Now, he actually sent two more letters. And the first one was sent March 20th, 1623. April 20th, 1623. Here are the names of them that be dead of the company came over with us to serve under our lieutenants. And uh, then he gives a list of uh, 17 men, two women, and another child. All these is died out of my master's house since I came. We came in but at Christmas, and this is the 20th day of March. And the Saliers say that there is two-thirds of 150 dead already, and thus I am praying to God to send me good success that I may be redeemed out of Egypt. So I would say, as far as Richard is concerned, he is a slave. Loving Father... I pray you to this man who delivers this letter very exceedingly kindly, for he hath done much for me, both on my journey and since. I entreat you to not forget me, but by any means redeem me. For this day we hear there are 26 of English men slain by Indians, and they have taken a penance of Mr. Pountus, and have gotten pieces, or muskets, armor, swords, all of them from English, till it is too late that they be upon us, and then there is no mercy. Therefore, if you love and respect me as your child, release me from this bondage and save my life. Now you may save me or let me be slain with infidel. Ask this man who delivers this letter. He knoweth that all is true, and just that I say here, if you do redeem me, the company must send for me to my Mr. Herod, so this is in my master's name, your loving son, Richard Frethern. And now one more. Ah, depression with McBurdo. April 3rd, 1623. Moreover, on the third day of April, we heard that after this the rogues had gotten the penance and had taken all the furniture as pieces, muskets, swords, armor, coats of mail, powder, shot, and all the things that they had to trade withal. They killed the captain and cut off his head, and rowing with the tail of the boat foremost, they set up a pole and put the captain's head upon it, and so rowed home. And then the devil set them on again so that they furnished a boat, 200 canoes with above a thousand Indians and came and thought to have taken the ship but she was too quick for them which is a thing much talked of for they always feared a ship but now the rogues grow very bold and can use pieces some of them as well or better than Englishmen for an Indian did shoot with Mr. Charles my master's kinsman at a mark of white paper and he hit first, but Mr. Charles could not hit it. <laughs> Having said that, I do have some thoughts. I'm just going to pause for a second because Richard is not good with periods. Uh, in fact, he doesn't use them. He uses a lot of commas like we would use period, but I would say he wasn't uh, he or the person who took this letter and dictated in dictation. Uh, yeah, doesn't use periods. But see the envy of the slaves, for when they could not take the ship then, men saw them threaten Accomac, that this is the next plantation, and now either is no way but starving. For the governor told us, and Sir George, except the ship Seaflower come in, or that we can fall foul of these rogues and get some corn from them. Above half the land will surely be starved, for they had no crop last year by reason of these rogues, so that we have no corn, but as ships do relieve us, nor we shall hardly have any crop this year. And I'm hungry. And we are as like to perish first as any plantation, for we have but two hogsheads of meal left to serve us in these two months, 
If the sea flower does stay so long before she comes in, that meal is but three weeks bread for us, at least for four, about the bigness of a penny loaf in England. But that is but a half penny loaf a day a man. Is that it not a strange thing to think you? Essentially, is that not a strange thing? I mean, that is not a lot of food, especially when you're fighting and you're farming. Like, it's dire. <laughs> but what will it be when we shall go a month or two and never see a bit of bread? As my master doth say we must do, and he said he is not able to keep us all, and we shall be turned up to the land and eat bark of trees or mold or the ground therefore, and with weeping tears I beg of you to help me. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. Oh, that you did see my daily and hourly sighs, groans, and tears, and thumps that I afford mine own breast, and rue and curse the time of my birth with holy Job. I thought no head had been able to hold so much water hath mine and doth daily flow from my eyes. But this is certain, I never felt the want of a father or mother until now. But now, dear friends, full well I know and rue it, although it were too late before I knew it. I pray you talk with this honest man who delivers this letter. He will tell you more. And then, now I have cast, I can set down. And unfortunately, after that letter, at some point, he died. It is uh, believed that he died very quickly after the last one. There we go. Be poor, get indentured, be starved and worked to death, and die by the age of 14. Ah, the good old days. My very first episode was about being killed for adultery, so here we go. Something else. Ah, colonial America. Lovely. In the 1600s. What do I say? It got better. I can't do this anymore, man. My head's about to explode. I got nothing. I just got nothing.